inviting me here. It's, it, it, it's great. I normally work in a university, and so to be able to hang out in an art space and talk to artists is a really nice thing for me to do. So I'm, I'm really grateful to her for that. So my name is Tom Rice. I'm a lecturer in anthropology uh, in at the University of Exeter in, uh, in England, which is about three hours from London by train in the southwest of the country. And I have this very strong interest in sound and listening. And all my work really is on sound and listening. And I teach a course called Sound and Society, which is about anthropology and sound, essentially. So I'm an anthropologist, and normally anthropologists study exotic peoples, uh, people in non-Western societies. But I'm an anthropologist who works close to home. All my research takes place in the UK, but I draw on the work and use the work of anthropologists who work uh, far afield in places like Papua New Guinea, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And I use their ideas uh, about the way that people listen in those kind of cultures uh, to look at the way that we listen in this particular aspect of British culture. So I'm an academic. And I write papers and books and that kind of thing. And I have uh, recently finished this book called Hearing and the Hospital. And I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that come up in this book today. Hearing and the Hospital, Sound, Listening, Knowledge and Experience. And it's due out very soon in, in August. But although I do this writing... I also uh, love radio, and I work as a radio producer sometimes, and this is just an example of, sorry this is a bit clumsy, but uh, this is an example of a programme I made, uh, I don't know if you know this guy, um, he has no hair like me, but uh, he's called Midgeur, he was really famous uh, in a band called Ultravox. Um, in the 80s. In the 80s, yes, 80s band, very famous 80s band. Um, but he was the presenter for this programme, which looked at the relationship between music and water. So, uh, water's been a very strong influence on all kinds of classical music, but it was also used a lot by uh, the Fluxus artists in the 1970s, who uh, really uh, used a lot of drips in their music because they were exploring indeterminacy and you can't control a drip very precisely, or you can't control a lot of drips. And they used water a lot in their experiments. And then recently as well, uh, music producers have begun using, or are using, water samples in making electronic music. Uh, so I really just charted that kind of curve uh, of the use of water throughout these different musical practices, basically. So. If you would like to, uh, sorry, this is a little clumsy. If you'd like to listen to that program, uh, I've been a bit naughty and I have the whole program on my personal website uh, at this link, so you can uh, download and, and hear it there. But I'm going to talk for about an hour. And I'm going to show you some images and play you some sounds. And this is all going to be about a research project that I've been doing for a really long time now. 14 years I've been working on the same project. And this project is about the importance of sound and listening in the hospital environment. So I've been doing this project about the way that different types of auditory knowledge are can be found in the hospital environment. What is auditory? Auditory just means to do with listening, to do with sound. Okay. Yeah. So we are now having an auditory interaction because yes. I'm listening to you and you're listening to me. Yeah, ich habe das bisher nur als auditiv, auditiv äh, bekannt, nicht auditory. What does auditiv mean? Yeah, well. Okay, so uh, yes, this is um, this, and the book that I've 
written about this is, uh, well, this book is all about that hospital research. So the book's in three sections, and there are three different kind of fields of auditory knowledge that I think you can find in a hospital. Firstly, I look at patient experiences of being in hospital. I don't know how many of us have spent a night in hospital, but most people who do really notice the sounds, partly because it's a very strange, very alien soundscape full of the whole work of care and medicine, uh, various technologies, you know, the privacy curtains coming around the bed, the trolleys being pushed everywhere. And so sound is an important aspect of hospitalisation. So I look at patient experiences of hospital soundscapes in the first section. In the second section, I look at the way that nurses uh, use sound in their work. So on a ward, the residual, uh, the, the level of sound will be an important indicator of how comfortable your patients are. And if somebody cries out and asks for help, then you need to be able to, the sounds are important in directing your attention. So you can do a visual distracting task, and then your, the sounds help you focus uh, where your work's going to be directed. So sound's important in managing a ward. So I look at those practices that nurses use, which aren't professional, they're not taught to do these things, they just do them anyway. But then most of the book is about doctors and how they listen to the body, and they use sound in diagnosis. So... Uh, the biggest section is about this professional listening practice, very skilled, takes a lot of training, and is important as a status symbol for uh, the act of listening to somebody with a stethoscope is an important uh, symbol of the doctor and his work. So, just to think sociologically for a moment, these different types of listening reflect different levels of knowledge and different levels of skill and they reflect also the hierarchy and the organisation of people within the hospital. So what I've tried to do is use sound as a way of uh, and, and listening as a way of understanding the, the social organisation of the hospital, if you see what I mean. So here are some doctors this is really what I was getting at about the stethoscope being a very important symbol of, uh, of the doctor. If you were putting on a play and you wanted to say, this guy is a doctor, you give him a stethoscope and everybody understands. And it's the same in real life. You know, doctors are very proud of their stethoscopes. They wear them in a very, you know, here I am kind of way. So, the stethoscope is very much a central kind of concern for me. And what I've done, the, the metaphor at the heart of this book, is that I've turned the stethoscope into an ethnographic instrument. So it's not something, or it's something that doctors use, but I've made it something that anthropologists use too. And I've turned the stethoscope back on the hospital, so that you're listening to what's going on in the hospital, and you're using a kind of focused, careful, concentrated way of listening to try to understand that space, physical space and that social space, yeah? So if you've understood that, you've understood everything I have to say in, in microcosm, really. So, I thought I'd just take a little while to explain why I became interested in this. And the reason is that uh, when I was a student, I was working in Edinburgh, and I was, as I explained, I love radio, and I was working for, as a volunteer at this place, Red Dot Radio, Hospital Radio in Edinburgh, and my job was to go around and ask the patients what they wanted to listen to, and what they wanted to hear more of, and what, it, what I learned was that the re main reason that they listened to uh, the radio was to escape the sounds of the ward, which they found very oppressive, uh, it woke them early, it prevented them from getting to sleep, it's, you know, it surprised them and startled them sometimes, it was always annoying, and you know, this was in the days before the iPod, and these were mainly elderly people, old people, 
because most people in hospitals are old. And so they weren't familiar in the way that we might be with using technology to kind of manage their soundscape. They were, one of my favorite phrases, a, a captive audience. Uh, they had no choice but to lie in bed and listen to uh, what was going on. But they could escape into the radio for three hours every day, and they did that. So I was very interested in this, um, and I ended up writing uh, my student project, my big student project, about uh, patient experiences of hospital soundscapes. But an interesting thing that I should mention is that it wasn't just that the sounds were unpleasant. They also sometimes used listening to understand what was going on in the hospital. So they could tell, not by looking, but just by listening, when the nurses were changing their working pattern, their shifts. Because they could hear new people coming in and, and uh, other people leaving. They knew when the food was going to arrive, when the medicine was going to arrive, because they could hear all these things happening. So they started to understand the routine and the rhythm of hospital life through the soundscapes. So I say that sounds play an important part in institutionalizing people, in getting people used to a particular rhythm and way of life. And that's true in the hospital, I think. Is that kind of clear? And at the time that I decided to uh, do this uh, project, I, um, well, I ended up getting a bit of it published in this journal called uh, Anthropology Today. <coughs> the title doesn't matter, but you can see from the artwork they provided that uh, you know it encapsulates this idea quite kind of crudely, exaggerated, but it does get the idea across that you have this person kind of exposed to sounds in this way. But at the same time that I was writing this stuff, I began to read the works of this guy, an anthropologist called Stephen Felt. And he works with a group called the Kaluli. Uh, here are a couple of Kaluli men. Um, and he works in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, obviously, is just above Australia here. But they live, the Kaluli live inland. Uh, right in the middle of Papua New Guinea, basically. And their landscape is very steep, very mountainous, and very, very densely forested. And what Felt realised, what Stephen Felt realised, was that for the people who live in this environment, for the Kaluli, sound became a particularly important aspect of their lives. So, for example, when they were hunting, you couldn't see, because of the forest, where the game was moving. You, could, you had to track it acoustically, and you had to identify it acoustically because of the calls it was making. So they relied on sound in order to do that. But also, this is a rainforest, and it's very wet, and these hills are covered in little streams and rivers, and they tumble down the hill, they form waterfalls and it spills over and creates another waterfall and another waterfall. So there's this big pattern of waterfalls right across this landscape. And the Kaluli navigate uh, through the sounds that these waterfalls produce. Because they can't see into the forest, they, they navigate by saying, well, you keep that sound up here on your left, you keep this sound on your right, you walk towards that sound. So, there's this really amazing practice of acoustic navigation. And as a consequence, a lot of their place names, their names for places, are sounds. So they're onomatopoeic, so like gulugula or gulugula sa. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, they, that's how they navigate and map this landscape. And they do other lots of amazing things with sound. Uh, they do duets with waterfalls because uh, the presence of moving water makes them feel nostalgic and sentimental, and it moves them into uh, wanting to sing. And 
that lots of other things uh, too. They use the sounds of certain birds, their calls, to provide the melodies in their music. So they copy the sound of the bird in the instruments. And <coughs> also their whole musical ethos is based on the sounds of the rainforest. So that in the rainforest you have the kind of hiss made by cicadas and birds and insects. And then you have animal sounds in there too. And for the Kaluli, it's the same. They have rattles, which make the same, the same hissing noise. And then, and then they have drums over the top. But when you sing, the idea isn't for one person to sing and then stop and then another person sing, like we do. They like it to overlap and for a voice to come out and then fade and come out and fade and be mixed together, basically. So they take their whole acoustic, uh, uh, musical acoust uh, aesthetic, their musical aesthetic, from the rainforest. So it's a very strongly acoustic society. And other anthropologists who work with groups very close to the Kaluli say similar things about their, the, the groups they study. You know, they have this very strong acoustic way of being. And Stephen Feld, invents this term to describe what the Kaluli have. So, acoustic and epistemology. Epistemology meaning way of knowing. <coughs> so they have an, what he calls an acoustemology, an acoustic way of knowing. And my work is really an attempt to see uh, what the acoustic way of knowing is in a hospital. So, I work in the UK, not Papua New Guinea, I work in a city, not in the forest. I work with, in a modern institution and not uh, a community. But I'm still looking to see if there are kind of similarities in the way that people know through sound. So, I've spoken a bit about the, uh, the first study I did of hospital soundscapes. And when I was doing that study, I started to realise that, yes, there were these patients listening, but also that doctors were listening to patients' bodies using stethoscopes. And I realised that you have one soundscape, which is the soundscape of the hospital, and then you have another soundscape in it, which is the soundscape of the body. And patients are listening to one soundscape, and doctors are listening to another one, but there are these... It's like, uh, like Russian dolls, uh, like, uh, like a babushka. Um, you have one soundscape in another soundscape in another soundscape. And different people unpack different soundscapes, basically. So I started to do another project in this hospital in London, uh, St Thomas's Hospital, right in the very centre of London. This is Big Ben, this is the Thames. This is the London Eye. It's right there, right in the middle of London. And I started to work there in a cardiology unit, a heart medicine unit. And I did that because I knew already that stethoscopic listening was used a lot in heart medicine, listening to the lungs, listening to the heart. Um, so I knew it would be, there would be a lot of listening going on in that way. And I also knew that there were lots of technologies being used in this place that also have elements of listening and sound involved. So this is echocardiography, which uses ultrasound to make images of the heart. Now that is a visual technique, but this does actually also produce sounds, and I'll play you some of those sounds in a minute. And the technicians use the sounds to, uh, in making these images and interpreting these images. But you could also say that using ultrasound to produce an image is another element of what I call acoustic illumination. You're using sound in order to be able to see. So like the, like the uh, Kaluli where they're tracking the animals in the forest, they are listening, uh, they're using sound to see what the animal is and where it's going, yeah? And in a similar way, 
These techniques are using sound, or stethoscopic listening is using sound to be able to see what's going on inside the body. And in a similar way, that's what's happening in this technique too. And in electrocardiography, you also have uh, a beep, which is marking when the heart is moving, when the heart is beating. And so the environment in an, a cardiology ward is full of these technological sounds, but they are nonetheless kind of important in medical practice and in um, making sense of what's happening inside the body. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so I began uh, this work in St. Thomas's and I was really interested in <coughs> this particular kind of auditory knowledge that these doctors have and use with, when they listen through stethoscopes. And I was also interested in it as a tradition. How do they pass that knowledge on to a new generation of doctors? So how do um, doctors teach medical students how to listen? That was one of my questions. And I spent a long time shadowing doctors and medical students and patients, uh, looking at how this technique was taught and how new auditory knowledge was created in the medical students, essentially. So, listening is, well, I'm an anthropologist. Anthropologists love thinking about traditions. And medicine has a very strong tradition of listening. So, stethoscopic listening is quite new. Um, back, way back in the 4th, 5th century BC, Hippocrates uh, describes a technique called immediate auscultation, which is just pressing your ear to a patient's body in order to try to hear what's going on inside it. And that's got three big problems. It's very inaccurate. Uh, it's, the sound is being conducted through your ear and it's not very precise, you can't, it's not very located very uh, closely. It's also unhygienic, you know, if you've got somebody who's really ill and sick, the last thing you want to do is press your ear to their chest. And it's also, uh, doctors found, it was uh, indecent, improper, because for a man to press his ear to a woman's bosom, uh, was thought to be too uh, sexually explicit and too, uh, too intimate. So, three big problems with auscultation, uh, with, with, this, with this technique. But there was this sense all along that maybe you could use sounds better than this. Maybe sound could reveal more of the body. And I'm just going to show you... Oh, sorry. Well... I, I forgot about this slide. So this is a blind doctor, Albert Andre Nast, using immediate auscultation on a on a baby this time. But see what I mean about the intimacy of that act. You know, this is a very sweet, very touching, nice picture. But it, it's like that because listening in this case is a very intimate act. But just to show you this. You don't need to read it all, but I'll read it to you. So this is a man called Philip Hook, <coughs> writing in 1700, when, and he's really complaining about immediate auscultation and realising that they could do something better. There may be a possibility of discovering the internal motions and actions of bodies by the sound they make. Who knows, but that as in a watch, we may hear the beating of the balance and the running of the wheels and the striking of the hammers and the grating of the teeth and the multitudes of other noises. Who knows, but that it may be possible to discover the works performed in the several offices and shops of a man's body, and thereby discover what instrument or engine is out of order. <laughs> so, it's interesting because he's using industrial analogies, and he's comparing the human body to a town. And he's suggesting that, just like a town has its acoustic patterns and its acoustic rhythms, that a body may have acoustic patterns and acoustic rhythms in the same way. So, this guy, Alan Brugger, 
made a big improvement on immediate auscultation. He was the son of uh, a pub owner, and his job as a child had been to test whether beer barrels were empty or full by hitting them with a hammer. And he knew that if it makes a doom, doom, dull noise, it's full, and if it makes a doom, doom, light, higher, lighter sound, it's hollow. And he just applied the same principle to people's lungs. <laughs> and you can measure whether a lung is full of fluid or where the fluid comes up to by tapping it in this way. And that's why you see doctors doing this sometimes. So that's called percussion, like hitting something with a drum. And this was a big improvement, but it's a bit limited uh, for obvious reasons. Empty or full are the only two indicators it gives. So the big step forward came with René Lenec, who discovered the stethoscope. Uh, or he is thought to be the man who invented the stethoscope. Basically, uh, he started using a wooden yeah, tube. Did you really get 140 years old? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> No, but thanks for making that point. Uh, because it should be 1826, and he died young. And he died of tuberculosis, which was the main disease that he was trying to cure. And the reason is thought to be that he contracted it by pressing his ear, to, getting too close to too many patients. And one of the good things that the stethoscope allowed was for doctors to get distance between themselves and the patients. And that meant... Uh, that, that, well, that, that distance says a lot of things because it's not only its perceptual distance, its objectivity, its detachment, but it's also social distance. It's like I am separate from you, I'm away from you, I'm keeping you at length. Yeah? Uh, but it's also a very effective instrument because it was precise and isolated very small parts of the body. It amplified sounds, and um, it allowed uh, a degree of accuracy that had not been possible before. So what Lenek would do is he would listen to patients who came into his clinic. He would make notes of what he heard. The patient would die. They would cut the patient open, and he'd make notes on what was there in the body. And so correspond this, what he'd heard, to what was happening in the body. And he started to detect this sound. The only real words I want you to pick out here is petroliquy. Uh, this was a sound that he identified as being distinctive of tuberculosis. And it was really important because he started to detect this sound in people who were appeared healthy, but who would later develop tuberculosis. And so Lenek found the first sign that was diagnostic of tuberculosis in people before death, basically. So it meant that if you found somebody with this sound, they could be isolated and treated and hopefully make some recovery. They wouldn't just inevitably die. So the stethoscope was a huge uh, help in diagnosing and beginning the treatments of tuberculosis. But obviously it didn't help René Lenec, who died of tuberculosis uh, very early. But he was a very, Lenec was a very acoustically sensitive man. He was thought to be very good at playing the flute. And it's some, sometimes said that his stethoscope is like a musical instrument. Uh, it looks like a flute. And it's made along the same principles as a flute. But just look at how he describes this sound. So this is somebody, case 29, he heard a tinkling similar to that of a small bell just ceasing to ring, or of a, a fly buzzing in a china vase. So unbelievable detail, and lots of musical analogy, lots of borrowing from the soundscape of the world to describe the soundscape of the body. So, good crossover between the two things there. Okay, so obviously since Lenek's death, doctors have gone on to 
uh, improved the stethoscope. It's now got two earpieces, and uh, they've also gone on to improve. Uh, they listen to all parts of the body, and they are better now at anatomy. They know what's going on in the body better than Lynette did. So Lynette would listen to the heart, but he didn't know what was happening in the heart to make the sounds very well. Whereas doctors now can see the process and they know the process, and they can make sounds correspond to that they know what they hear, they know that the they know what the sound is basically what it means as far as how the heart is working. So I mentioned that uh, I was interested in how auditory knowledge, acoustic knowledge, gets passed down from one generation to another. And one of the things I did at St Thomas's Hospital was sit in on classes where students were taught to listen. And I'm just going to play you uh, a CD that was given to me and the other students and was designed to help them to learn to identify particular heart sounds. Uh, let me see. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, I'm not going to do that quite yet. Uh, <laughs> I was wrong. Okay, yeah. So... <laughs> so the first question we've got... In these classes where people were being taught stethoscopic listening, the first question we were asked is... What, does a, what sound does a heart make? And we all know that because we watch television and we see films and we hear music. And for us, the sound of the heart beating has become a signifier of excitement, of danger, of uh, potential death, of life saved. So we're quite used to the sounds of the heart beating. They're used in our popular culture a lot. So you could say that in some ways we're quite stethoscopic in that we uh, are quite familiar with body sounds. They, they, they play quite an obvious role in our culture. But in medicine they say that the heart goes lubbed up. Lubbed up, lubbed up. Now the first sound, the lub, this is a diagram of the heart, obviously. The first heart sound, the lub, is caused by the closure of this valve and this valve together, lub, and this valve and this valve together for the second sound. So they work in pairs, lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. And the sound that the heart makes is actually the valves snapping shut like that. Here's a simpler diagram. So this is the mitral, the aortic, the pulmonary and the tricuspid valves. Love, duck, love, duck, love, duck, like that. Now, normally, when blood flows around the heart and through these valves, it does so smoothly, so that the only sounds that you hear are these closing valves. But sometimes, problems occur with the valves. So they might, they normally they're like this. But sometimes they become stiff, or sometimes they become floppy. <laughs> and when, uh, <laughs> when, um, when blood goes through these valves, it, sometimes it has to be forced through them, and that creates turbulence, and that turbulence produces a sound. In a similar way, if the valve's floppy, the blood comes through, but it isn't held by the closing valve, it drains back. And that creates another sound at a different stage in the cardiac cycle. And basically, you can imagine there's lots of different ways a valve can go wrong. And so there's lots of different kinds of sound that can be produced uh, by, in this way. And these heart sounds are called murmurs. And that word itself captures this kind of, the soft kind of murmur, uh, kind of something of the heartbeat in there. So they're called heart murmurs, anyway. So, students were being taught how to listen for and hear these murmurs in patients. It's a very difficult thing to do. 
It takes years of practice and training. And once again, for doctors who can do it, it's a big kind of status symbol. And, you know, a doctor who can just put on a stethoscope and say, yeah, it's pulmonary regurgitation, you know, that's, that's, very, that's very impressive. And it's very, very hard to learn to do this. Regurgitation. Well, that's, what, that's one of the things it's called. So, um, one of the things they used to help uh, us to learn to listen to murmurs was uh, this CD. And I'm going to play you some examples now of some heart murmurs. Not those. Just a second. You will now hear a recording of the normal heartbeat. <laughs> the first heart sound is caused by mitral and tricuspid valve closure and is sharper in quality than the second sound, which represents aortic and then pulmonary closure. That's the normal Both sounds. Okay. We will now turn to pathological conditions where diseased valves cause murmurs because of increased turbulence. There may also be changes in the quality of the two heart sounds or extra clicks or sounds. You will now hear the heart sounds and murmurs of a patient with moderate, non-rheumatic mitral regurgitation. The first heart sound is soft and is immediately followed by a loud, harsh systolic murmur. You will hear the heart sounds of a patient with moderate aortic stenosis. Note the loud crescendo decrescendo systolic murmur, which is followed by a soft but clearly audible aortic closure. This murmur is usually best heard in the aortic area and at the left sternal edge, radiating into the carotids as well as towards the apex. You will now hear the murmur of severe calcific aortic stenosis. The murmur is again of the crescendo-decrescendo type and is loud, long, almost squeaky in quality. In some cases it can take on a musical quality, being described as a seagull murmur. Last guy, right? Seagull? Last guy? Note that the set. Okay. Uh, so, there you go. Now, obviously it's a bit different listening on this to listening through a stethoscope. These sounds are huge and loud and clear. But when you've got, you know, it's a stethoscope, you have to find the sound and put the stethoscope in the right place. And there are all kinds of noises created by the friction of the piece of the stethoscope on the skin. And, you know, you have your supervisor looking over your shoulder saying, what's going on? You know, it's all, it's, it's very, very difficult indeed. So it takes a long time to be able to acquire the skill to listen effectively. But the real point here that I suppose I'm making anthropologically is that we're not normally conscious of having to learn to listen. We think, uh, well, we think, you know, we're born, we become children, we become adults. We listen automatically to whatever makes it, uh, comes into our attention. But anthropologists would say that's not the case that all our senses are attuned according to the culture in which we grow up. And what we listen to, what we ignore, what we attach meaning to, is all influenced by our culture and the culture in which we emerge. What's very interesting about this uh, process of students being taught to listen in a new way is that it shows up some of the actual techniques by which ways of concentrating, 
ways of paying attention, ways of ignoring sounds, ways of attaching meaning to sounds, actually become apparent. So that, for example, Stephen Felt with the Kaluli doesn't even mention how they might learn to listen in a particular way. But what this research does, I think, um, and I talk about it in much more detail in the book, is show ways in which people actually, methods in which people actually learn to listen. So this is a particular form of listening which, because people are being taught as adults uh, and because people are trying to show them how to do it, the auditory knowledge becomes clear and is made plain, obvious. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? Okay, great. So, just a few concepts, really, now, is all I want to talk about. Uh, just fun concepts. So, I think it's interesting that in uh, the Kanuli example, you have these waterfalls flowing. And they talk about the flow of water through the landscape and the flow of the voice through the body uh, as being very important uh, acoustic ideas. And it's the same in, in stethoscopic listening. The flow of sounds, the heart murmurs are made by the flow of blood around the body and through the heart. Lung sounds are made by the flow of air in and out of the lungs. Uh, these sounds, borborygmy, which are the gurgle sounds that your stomach makes, are made by, by matter flowing through the gut. So flow is a very important idea here. And in some ways there's a similarity in the acoustic aesthetic between kind of Kaluli and uh, medical ways of listening. But it's clear that stethoscopic listening amplifies sounds in, re in reality, in real terms, but it also amplifies them conceptually as well. It draws attention to the fact that the body generates sounds, and it draws attention to the fact that the soundscape of the body is rhythmical, flows, but is very complex and actually has lots of detail which we would never normally be conscious of in our everyday lives. We, it draws attention to an aspect of ourselves that we are only, it's only normally at the very fringe, at the very edge of our consciousness. So stethoscopic listening does something conceptually uh, powerful, I think. It also makes the, the, body, the boundaries of the body uh, porous. I'll need some help with the translation here. Yeah. Because the, the body can open up acoustically wherever you place, the, whenever you listen to it by pressing an ear, wherever you place the stethoscope, it, it, uh, and add, the body opens up and uh, sounds kind of can spill or leak or seep out. So that you have this idea of the body uh, not as a tightly bounded space, but as a, a porous space, where uh, acoustically porous, anyway. It's interesting, too, that when you think about auscultation or stethoscopic listening, what am I doing? Uh, when you think about stethoscopic listening, the body becomes an acoustic map, in a way. So, although you could listen to any part of the body, and people do, doctors listen sometimes to the brain, if there's a big tumour in the brain, the flow of blood to the tumour can be heard, uh, we use a stethoscope. Uh, you can listen to the sound of water passing across the kidneys, if you're very careful. You can listen to the sounds of joints moving, uh, and, and you can tell if there's a lot of friction in a joint by listening to it with the stethoscope. But usually, you press the stethoscope to certain points. It's interesting because now this is a, basically an acoustic map of the, of the chest, or of the body. You, these are the points where you listen to the different valves. Mitral, tricuspid, no, mitral pulmonary, uh, aortic, uh, bicuspid, tricuspid. So it's almost like you're kind of mining the body for the sounds. You, there are points where it's a good place to go and points where it's a good place not to go. It's not like it would logically sort of, I mean the heart is actually initial. I mean, no, it's, it's partly it's because, it's partly because uh, these points fall over major blood vessels uh -huh. 
and the sounds be, be carry down these vessels. Through the pipe. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to listen directly above the valve. It's better to listen, in fact, slightly yeah. along the vessel from it. So another thing that uh, I found was that stethoscopic listening creates people as acoustic objects. So, for example, sometimes a patient would be come into the hospital who had a very interesting murmur. And the teaching doctors would say, OK, all the students, go and listen to that person. <laughs> <laughs> so they become a minor celebrity for a day, but they're also very conscious of just being like a tape recorder. You know, people come here, they listen to my murmur, they go away again. You know? Yeah. So, it's as if they're becoming, uh, as the, it's, it's objectification, you know, they're, they're, they're just objects, they're clinical objects, but they're acoustic objects. They are things to be listened to, rather than people in a more holistic sense. And the medical students too were very conscious of this and they felt, you know, at times that they felt bad for reducing a person to just their heart sounds. But it's interesting that people can be objectified in that way. We normally think of objectification happening through vision. And, you know, you objectify a woman by looking at her as a sex object, whatever. But here it's a different thing, like an acoustic object is what's taking, is what's emerging. So, another thing that happened was that students were encouraged to listen to themselves and listen to their own hearts. And that's very interesting because you become aware of the importance of sound in your own body, something that's normally not very close to the your surface of your consciousness, but also they become aware that you're vulnerable. You know, your sounds can tell you things that you don't want to hear. So three students out of about 30 found heart murmurs in, their, in themselves. And suddenly it was all very sinister and very serious and very upsetting. And so, Stethoscopic listening creates this sense that, yes, we do have a large number of sounds in our bodies, but it also creates an awareness of what your body is doing without you being aware of it. And a really interesting thing is that the reason auscultation became so valuable in medicine was that sounds don't lie. Patients lie. And patients don't, tell, uh, patients don't describe their symptoms well, or they, they, they're not very good at uh, knowing what's wrong with them. But sounds tell the truth, always. So, for the doctors, it was like a, listening to a different voice. You're listening to a voice that didn't try to deceive you, that couldn't deceive you, because it always spoke the truth. And, interestingly, uh, I did an interview recently with this guy who's a makes experimental radio programs. He's called Lawrence Abu Hamdan. And he made this program called The Freedom of Speech Itself. And he was talking about how a, a, a piece of software that is used by police and security forces in Britain, America, probably Germany, where they think that the software can detect uh, sounds in the voice that show that people are lying. And on the strength of this software and the decisions made by the software, they can imprison people, they can deny visas, this kind of thing. So there's the same idea being carried forward into the software, that the body itself doesn't lie. The body itself, the body's voices always tell the truth. Um, but they aren't, uh, they're, not, they're not susceptible to the kind of manipulations of people, deliberate manipulations of people. So I think there's an interesting continuity between stethoscopic listening and this new security software that's being produced. So, I'm going to kind of get around to summing up, maybe, but in quite a roundabout way. I think it's interesting that stethoscopic listening creates or reproduces bodies. But it 
reproduces different kinds of bodies. It reproduces perceiving bodies uh, because it's about training people to hear in a particular way. And it's about perceived bodies um, and the bodies that can be heard by using stethoscopic listening. So it produces the body as a particular sound producing thing, but it also produces people who are able to listen in a particular way. So I think there's an interesting kind of dualism happening there, that sound creates listeners and it creates things or people to be listened to. So when you go to the doctor and he says, I'm going to listen to your chest, it's probably automatic that you would just let them do it, you know, lift up your jumper, whatever it is. And there's the sense that he is, uh, has acquired this way of perceiving the body, and you've, just, you've become a perceived body in a, a completely natural way. But it isn't natural at all. It's got a very long tradition, as we've seen, and it's part of a very complex, really, or... Yeah, it's part of a very rich history, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. But there's a lot of concern in medicine now that stethoscopic listening is dying. Because there are new technologies that, can, that you can use instead, basically. So before you needed the stethoscope to be able to understand what was happening in the heart. But now you can do an echocardiogram and you can see what's happening in the heart very quickly. The only reason you need to be any good at stethoscopic listening at all is so that you can tell if there's something wrong. If there is something wrong, then you can go and have it checked out on a scan. But in the past, it was the only instrument that doctors had, and they had to rely on it. But I would say, I would come back to the point that I made a little bit earlier, which is to say that Technologies like echocardiography and electrocardiography, they may not require the same kinds of listening, but they're still part of this acoustic history within medicine. They're still part of an acoustic tradition. And just to show you, kind of, we're all familiar with the sound made by an electrocardiograph, it's the beep, 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 beep sound, which is broadcasting through sound uh, an internal bodily event. In a similar way, it's doing the same thing as the stethoscope. The stethoscope takes sounds from inside and moves them outside. And in a way, the electrocardiograph does something similar. It makes a sound uh, that is giving you uh, information about a kind of biological system. It's biofeedback, basically. But it is still acoustic. But here are some sounds that are made So these are sounds made by an echocardiograph. to interpret the images. Those sounds are created, well, they tell you uh, the direction of the blood flow and the force of a blood flow as it goes across a valve. So in a way, they're still using a kind of acoustic knowledge coupled up with a kind of visual knowledge to uh, investigate the heart. So I would say that 
Western medicine has this acoustic culture, and that acoustic culture is continuing, although it's changed a great deal in the last, say, 30, 40, 50 years. I want to finish by bringing back, bringing things back to patients' experiences of hospital uh, soundscapes. And I thought it's important, because we're in an art space, to bring in some sound art. And I wanted to play you just a little bit of uh, a project by this guy, John Wynne. Um, he did a study in the Harefield Transplant Hospital, which is near London. And as you can see, people are on some quite serious machines. And what he did was to interview patients about their experiences of having transplants, but also to ask them about the sounds of their machines and how they felt about these sounds, and also what they thought about the sounds in the uh, hospital more generally. So I'll just play you a little part of that. Um, I just would say that the people he interviews uh, are quite hard to understand. So uh, don't be surprised if you uh, don't get all of that, because they, they've got quite strong accents and they're talking in quite, quite softly. I'm sorry for the, um, my clunky changeovers here, but I have to do this the old-fashioned way. Well, I guess as with whatever environment you become familiar with, you gradually lose the the acute sensations that you first get. I mean, you can be really overwhelmed with the noises, especially if you're you have a room in the centre of the ward and, uh, as you know, there are loud alarm bells that clang and ring frequently. Very loud, raucous buzzers for people requiring nurses come into their rooms. Um, gradually that, that fades and you can almost not notice it. I spent the first week trying to turn the bells into flocks of Greek sheep and goats and imagine them up mountainsides, but it wasn't really very successful. And I ended up with great sympathy for Mohammed, I think, who hated bells, and he, that's why he has towers with his arms calling off them, because bells were out of favour. I can see why. It's a lifesaver for these, you know, we pass the lifesaver. It's actually, you could call it a heart, it's just in a box. A couple of uh, batteries keep me alive um, until I get a new heart. Um, it's kept me alive for a year now, it'll be 12 months tomorrow.
especially if you think how it's not really giving me that noise. But as you walk, it gets faster. As you sleep, it goes slower. And you get used to it after a long time. And it's just part of you now. Well, it's part of me now. So. When they actually turn it off to do your off pump and test, I grab the chair and I thought, my heart's not really doing well. It's just, I've always been a nervous patient. Seems to have a rhythm to it if you listen to it carefully. Four beats in there. Seems to have a sort of. It doesn't constantly. It does four beats and then changes and does. So it's pretty sobering stuff, uh, but just these really extraordinary kind of fusion, fusions of person, machine. It's, it, there's a kind of cyborg soundscape happening here, where machines are replacing organs and where people are having to live with a, a, a bodily soundscape that's completely transformed, where a machine is putting, is filling in, a, uh, uh, doing a biological process instead of an organ uh, or a piece of the body. And obviously these people uh, having quite uh, close, forging quite close acoustic relationships with these, these machines. So uh, interesting um, things happening here in terms of the hospital soundscape and the bodily soundscape kind of fusing all together. It's very hard to distinguish here between an internal soundscape and an external ward soundscape. The two things are inter intertwined. Uh, in, you, you can't distinguish between them, almost. The other one uh, piece that I wanted just to play you a little bit of is by a very young uh, sound artist in, based in India called Thindu something. Uh, and let's just call her Thindu. And uh, she has done an audio walk in the Kovai Medical Center and Hospital in uh, Coimbatore in, in India. And um, I don't know if any of you know the sound walks of Janet Cardiff. Uh, I'm getting a few nods. Uh, it's very much in that style. You, uh, visitors wear a pair of headphones and she, has, she speaks uh, a set of instructions on how you're to walk around the hospital and at the same time so she took, walks you through the public spaces but she stops you at certain places and where you can't go in she says kind of I'm going in for you and, and she goes and uh, the sound goes inside and you hear what's going on behind the doors and then you come back out after a time and you move on and it, it's partly documentary but it's also there are strong fictional elements so uh, there are some kind of mini performances happening uh, that, that she uh, puts on inside these uh, wards. So for example, uh, in one, a family are trying to wake up their so uh, son who's in a coma by teasing him. And she didn't record that. She, it's, it's, it's produced by, uh, by, by actors. But in some of it, it is documentary. Um, it's also important for her because her father is a neurosurgeon in this hospital and she spent a long time as a child walking around these spaces waiting for her daddy, basically. And uh, she mentions him, she calls him Appa, in this piece that I'm going to play you now. Something that's a bit confusing about the way that it's presented on the internet is that there's also a book that accompanies this 
and she makes reference to the pictures in the book in the audio, which is a little confusing, but I'll play you it uh, anyway. It also has subtitles here. பேசும் சத்தம் So they're exploring yeah, the distinctiveness of that environment, but they also 
there's an interesting thing going on in that there's those very familiar sounds of people and footsteps and that kind of thing. There are also those very unfamiliar sounds of medical machines and that kind of thing, which uh, can create fear and anxiety and insecurity. And that's very much about those different layers of auditory knowledge that exist in the hospital, uh, which I was talking about at the very beginning so that you have patients listening to one set of sounds, engaging with them in a particular way, and you have medical professionals listening to a particular set of sounds and engaging with them in a particular way. So, uh, <coughs> I'm going to stop there, I think. I might just say... Uh, no, yeah, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>